Now, from CBS 4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy, and welcome to Facing South Florida. We have a lot to get to today. We have Danielle Levine Cava, who's running for mayor of Miami Dade County. She'll be joining us soon. And we'll also be looking at the chaos surrounding the selection of a new president for Miami Dade College. But first, the events in Puerto Rico this week have been nothing short of spectacular. Mass protests in the streets of San Juan forced Governor Rosello to announce he was resigning effective this Friday. Joining me now from Old San Juan to discuss this remarkable week is CBS News correspondent David Begno. David, thank you very much for joining us. Take us inside what this week has been like for you. Uh, historic, quite frankly, uh, and euphoric too. Uh, not not for me, but for the people who are here. I have to tell you, as a journalist, though, Jim, I have never covered anything that amounted to the kind of momentum that the people here generated in 12 days. And a lot of the momentum was fueled by millennials who were really on the front lines, literally, like on the police barricades, night after night. Uh, to be here and see those people initially say, "Wait a minute." We are offended by what you said in those chats. And then to see them plan the protest and then turn out in numbers and then come back in mass numbers. I mean, 500,000 was the first large protest. The second one was estimated to be close to three quarters of a million. Um, I'll never forget one man saying to me last night, he said, David, the reason those chats were the final straw is because for so long people have lost more things than you have fingers to count. But he said those chats were where we felt like we lost our dignity. And he said that's when we said it's enough. Well, and, that, and that's the excellent point because, you know, there had been a lot going that preceded this. Th those, the, the, those private chats that were released that were both homophobic, disparaging, insulting to so many people, seeing Rosseo talking to his, to his cronies in that sort of manner, that was the final straw. But it certainly, there was a large buildup to that. Again, talk a little bit about the buildup. It's not just Hurricane Maria. There's a lot of history here leading up to what happened this week. Well, look, there's been decades of corruption. There are 175,000 employees in the executive branch. Somebody's going to screw up. But the screw-ups here over the last two decades have involved people at the highest levels, at the highest levels, including the governor's office. So people who've lived here on the island have long suspected corruption, abuse, mismanagement. They've watched officials go to prison. Some of the most humble people I've ever met in my life are Puerto Ricans who are consistently, um, they feel like second class citizens and they will tell you that. So they've watched their leaders sort of mislead them, mismanage their money. Hurricane Maria was arguably the lowest point uh, for people in recent memory. And then those chats, those chats were the final straw that made people march into the streets. And they were, they were chats that literally verified what so many people suspected. I remember one woman probably, I don't know, a quarter of a mile from here who was marching. She said, let me tell you why we're infuriated. Because those chats prove to us everything we have suspected, everything we thought but couldn't prove. How does somebody who has a job who's not involved in government prove that there's corruption in their government? You prove it when you read those 889 pages, and you prove it when the governor looks in the camera and says, I'm sorry, and admits that it was shameful. What's interesting is, from an outsider perspective looking at this, there's sort of two ways you can sort of see the events of Puerto Rico over the past week. You can either see it as the natural result of a, of a corrupt government and a failed state that's bordering on chaos at any given moment in Puerto Rico, or you could take a more hopeful look and see it as the people rising up, responding, and having and demanding that their voices be listened to. Isn't that the way to sort of, it's either one or the other. You can view it yeah. a little bit of both, but really the other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But let me tell you, in 15 years of journalism, I've never covered something that involved people uniting and actually executing almost flawlessly. And what was astounding, Jim, was that you've got people in Puerto Rico who are so proud to be on opposite ends of the political spectrum. In Puerto Rico, politics is something people talk about everywhere. And they dig in the sides they're on, and they're not trying to come over to your side, right? They are proud to be on their side. 
But what happened was everybody united under this umbrella to get rid of the governor. Everybody. Like different people from all sides were, were hugging each other in the street. And people were saying to me, you don't see this. You don't see political parties coming together like this under one umbrella to oust the governor. Um, so how in 12 long days. They did it in 12 days. I'm telling you. Go ahead. So how long does that does that good feeling of coming together stay? Because obviously just removing Rosselló does not solve the problems, the underlying problems that sort of led to it as well. Yes, it takes away the person who was responsible for those private chats and text messages that were so insulting. But a lot of underlying problems remain. Where did we go from here in Puerto Rico? Well, let me tell you something. The protests are not over. <laughs> Wanda Vasquez is the woman who's going to become the new governor of Puerto Rico on August 2nd at 5 p.m. And there is a mass protest planned on Monday to try and prevent her from getting the job. Why? Because Ms. Vasquez herself has a bit of a black cloud hanging over her with allegations of corruption that she has been involved in. And let me tell you something. Some people might look at this and say, all right, they ousted the governor. If they think they're going to get the next one, that's, that's, that's a little naive, right? People will sort of settle down and move on. From covering this for the last 12 days, I would not doubt the ability of these people to rise up and also prevent Wanda Vasquez, that's her name, from becoming the next governor of Puerto Rico. And if they do that successfully, you know who's next? The Treasury Secretary. I mean, that's how far down the line we are, Jim. The governor's gone. There is no number two because the number two resigned because he was caught up in the chat scandal. So it's the number three, Wanda Vasquez, that's on deck. And if Wanda Vasquez doesn't get it, then you're talking about the man who runs the Treasury. Who, and you're going to have to fact check me on this, but I don't even think he's old enough to be the governor. It's 35 in Puerto Rico. He's not even 35. David, I'm, I'm we're almost out of time, and I want to be respectful of your time as well. But last thing I want to know from a selfish standpoint, from folks who are watching this in Florida, do you get the sense that we've always talked about the idea of, a, of people wanting to leave Puerto Rico, come to Florida after Hurricane Maria? Do you get the sense that people are looking to leave or to stay put and fight for their government there? No. I get the sense that people are trying to come back, Jim. That's just what I heard from people today. I can't tell you how many folks wrote to me, and I posted it on social media, where they were like, I left the island because I couldn't get a job, and I'm desperate to go back. I left the island because the power wasn't on for eight months after Maria, but I'm desperate to go back. The people who are from Puerto Rico love their island. They don't leave because they don't like it. They leave because there's not enough opportunity. They leave because they're completely depressed with the corruption that seems to be ubiquitous. So, no, I think it's just the opposite. We're not hearing from people who are trying to get out. We're hearing from people who are actually coming back. People from Ohio and Maine and California and Chicago who flew in to be a part of the protest. And now people who are encouraged so much by what they're seeing in media around the world that they're saying, maybe, just maybe, I'll bring my family back to the island. David, it's been a remarkable following you these, these days. Watching your tweets was the way I really understood what was going on in the streets. You did an amazing job. We're all very proud of you back here in Florida and just wanted to thank you again for taking some time to spend with us here this morning. Thank you, Jim. It's a really important story.